Chapter 30. The nature of parties has been imperfectly studied. It is, however, generally understood that a party has a pathology, that it is a kind of an individual, and that it is likely to be a very perverse individual. And it is also generally understood that a party, a party hardly ever goes the way it is planned or intended. This last, of course, excludes those dismal slave parties, whipped and controlled and dominated, given by ogreish professional hostesses. These are not the parties at all, but acts and demonstrations, but as spontaneous and peristalsis and as interesting as its end product. Probably everyone in Cannery Row had projected his imagination to how the party would be. The shouts of greeting, the congratulation, the noise and good feeling. And it didn't start that way at all. Promptly at eight o'clock, Mac and the boys, combed and clean, picked up their jugs and marched down the chicken walk, over the railroad track, through the lot across the street and up the steps of Western Biological. Everyone was embarrassed. Doc held the door open and, May and Mac made a little speech. Being as how it's your birthday, I and the boys thought we would wish you a happy birthday. And we got 21 cats for you for a present. He stopped and they stood formally on the stairs. Come on in, said Doc. Why, I'm, I'm surprised. I didn't even know you knew it was my birthday. Ah, Tomcat, said Hazel. We didn't bring him down. They sat down formally in the room at the left. There was a long silence. Well, said Doc, now you're here. How about a little drink? Max said, we brought a little snort, and he indicated the three jugs Eddie had been accumulating. There ain't no beer in it, said Eddie. Doc covered his early evening, re early evening reluctance. No, he said, you've got to have a drink with me. It just happens I laid in some whiskey. They were just seated formally, sipping delicately at, with, at the whiskey, when Dora and the girls came in. They presented the quilt. Doc laid it over his bed, and it was beautiful, and they accepted a little drink. Mr. and Mrs. Malloy followed with their presents. Lots of folks don't know what this stuff's going to be worth, said Sam Malloy, as he brought out the Chalmers 1916 piston and connecting rod. There probably ain't three of these here left in the world. And now people began to arrive in droves. Henry came in with the pink cushion three by four feet. He wanted to give a lecture on his new art form, but by the time the formality, but by this time, the formality was broken. Mr. and Mrs. Gay came in. Lee Chong presented the great string of firecrackers and the china lily bulbs. Someone ate the lily bulbs by 11 o'clock, but the firecrackers lasted longer. A group of comparative strangers came in from La Ida. The stiffness was going out the party quickly. Dora sat in a kind of throne, her orange hair flaming. She held the whiskey glass daintily with her little finger extended, and she kept an eye on the girls to see that they conducted themselves properly. Doc put dance music on the phonograph, and he went to the kitchen and began to fry the steaks. The first fight was not a bad one. One of the group from the Ida made an immoral proposal to one of the Dora's girls. She protested, and Mac and the boys, outraged at this breach of propriety, threw him out quickly and without breaking anything. They felt good then, for they knew they were contributing. Out in the kitchen, Doc was frying steaks in three skillets, and he cut up tomatoes and piled up sliced bread. He felt very good. Mac was personally taking care of the phonograph. He had found an album of Benny Goodman's trios. Dancing had started. Indeed, the party was beginning to take on depth and vigor. Eddie went into the office and did a tap dance. Doc had taken a pint with him to the kitchen and he helped himself from the bottle. He was feeling better and better. Everyone was surprised when he served the meat. Nobody was really hungry and they cleaned it up instantly. Now the food set the party into a kind of rich digestive sadness. The whiskey was gone and Doc brought out the gallons of wine. Dora sitting in throne said, Doc, play some of that nice music. I'd get Christoffel sick of that jukebox over home. Then Doc played Ardo and the more from an album of Monteverdi. And the guests sat quietly and their eyes were inward. Dora breathed beauty. Two newcomers crept up the stairs and entered quietly. Doc was feeling a golden pleasant sadness. The guests were silent when the music stopped. Doc brought out a book and he read in a clear deep voice. Even now, if I see in my soul a citron-breasted fair one, still golden-tinted, her face like our night stars, 
drawing onto her, her body beaten about with flame, wounded by the flaring spear of love, my first of all by reason of her fresh years, then is my heart buried alive in snow. Even now, if my girl with lotus eyes came to me again, weary with the dear weight of young love, again I would give her to these starved twins of arms and from her mouth drink down the heavy wine as a reeling pirate bee in fluttered ease steals up the honey from the nenuphar. Even now, if I saw her lying all white eyes and with calyrium the indents of her cheek lengthened to the bright ear in her pale side, so suffering the fever of my distance, then would my love for her be ropes of flowers and nights a black haired lover on the breast of day. Even now, my eyes that hurry to see no more are painting, painting faces of my lost girl, old golden rings that tap against cheeks of small magnolia leaves, oh white as so soft parchment where my poor divorced lips have written excellent stanzas of kisses and will write no more. Even now, death sends me the flickering of powdery lids over wild eyes and the pity of her slim body, all broken up with the weariness of joy, the little red flowers of her breast to be my comfort, moving about scarves and for my sorrow, wet crimson lips that once I marked as mine. Even now, they chatter her weakness through two bazaars, who was so strong to love me, and small men that buy and sell for silver being slaves, crinkle the fat about their eyes, and yet no prince of the cities of the sea has taken her, leading to his grim bed. Little lonely one, you clung to me as garment clings, my girl. Even now, I love long black eyes that caress like silk, ever and ever sad and laughing eyes, whose lids make such a sweet shadow when they close. It seems another beautiful look of hers. I love a fresh mouth, ah, a scented mouth, and curving hair, subtle as a smoke, and light fingers, and laughter of green gems. Even now, I remember that you made answer very softly, we being one soul, your hand on my hair, the burning memory rounding your near lips. I have seen the, pri the priestesses of Roddy make love at moonfall, and then in the carpeted hall with a bright gold lamp, lie down carelessly anywhere to sleep. Phyllis May was openly weeping when he stopped and Dora herself dabbed her eyes. Hazel was so taken back, by, taken back by the sound of their words that he had not listened to their meaning. But little world sadness had slipped over all of them. Everyone was remembering a lost love, everyone a call. Max said, Jesus, that's pretty. Reminds me of a Dane and he let it pass. They filled the wine glasses and became quiet. The party was slipping away in a sweet sadness. Eddie went out in the office and did a little tap dance and came back and sat down again. The party was about to recline and go to sleep when there was a tramp of feet on the stairs. A great voice shouted, where's the girls? Mac got up almost, almost happily and crossed quickly to the door and a smile of joy illuminated the faces of Hughie and Jones. What girls you got in mind? Mac asked softly. Ain't this a whorehouse? Cab driver said that there was one down here. You made a mistake, mister. Mac's voice was gay. Well, what's them dames in there? They joined battle then. They were a crew of a San Pedro tuna boat. Good, hearty, happy, fight-wise men. With the first rush, they burst through the party. Dora's girls had each one slipped off a shoe and held it by the toe. As the fight raged by, they would clip a man on the head with a spiked heel. Dora leaped for the kitchen and came roaring out with a meat grinder. Even Doc was happy. He flailed about with the Chalmers 1916 piston and connecting rod. It was a good fight. Hazel tripped and got kicked in the face twice before he could get to his feet again. The Franklin stove went over with a crash. Driven into a corner, the newcomers defended themselves with heavy books from the bookcases, but gradually they were driven back. The two front windows were broken out. Suddenly, Alfred, who had heard the trouble from across the street, attacked from the rear with his favorite weapon, an indoor ball bat. The fight raged down the steps and into the street and across into the lot. 
The front door was hanging limply from one hinge again. Doc's shirt was torn off and his slight strong shoulder dripped blood from a scratch. The enemy was driven halfway up the lot when the siren sounded. Doc's birthday party had rarely, Doc's birthday party had barely time to get inside the laboratory and wedge the broken door closed and turn out the lights before the police car cruised up. The cops didn't find anything, but the party was sitting up in the dark, giggling happily and drinking wine. The ship changed at the bear flag. The French contingent raged and full of hell. And then the party really got going. The cops came back, looked in, clicked their tongues and joined it. Mac and the boys used the squad car to go to Jimmy Brucius for more wine. And Jimmy came back with them. You could hear the roar of the party come from end to end of Cannery Row. The party had all the best qualities of a riot and a night on the barricades. The crew from the San Pedro tuna boat crept humbly back and joined the party. They were embraced and admired. A woman five blocks away called the police to complain about the noise and couldn't get anyone. The cops reported their own car stolen and found it later on the beach. Doc sitting cross-legged on the table smiled and tapped his fingers gently on his knee. Mac and Phyllis May were doing Indian wrestling on the floor and the cool bay wind blew in through the broken windows. It was then that someone lighted the 25 foot string of firecrackers.